That did bring back some memories for me. I don't know if uh, Brenda recalls that or not, but Dr. John R. Rice used to sing that in some of the Sword of the Lord conferences years ago when he was alive. And so that's immediately what came to my mind. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to page, uh, page number. <laughs> I could give you like Brother King uh, did the other day. It's 1411 in my Bible. I know that doesn't mean a whole lot to you, I'm sure, but uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I was tempted to forego uh, making some of the comments from chapter 6 because, as you know, I've been hitting some of the highlights as we go through the book of 1 Timothy and just dealing with encouragements on working with people. And uh, then I was going to go right now to uh, chapter 1 and begin the detailed study through the book of 1 Timothy. But I felt like since I'd done the five chapters, I should go ahead and give you just a couple of the things that I pulled out. Once again, hitting the high points of the book of 1 Timothy. is What I'm trying to accomplish in this overall view is just letting us see all the different topics that Paul addresses to Timothy. And the reason it's important is because it's those topics that we have to address in the local church. Sometimes when preachers preach, some folks think that the preacher's meddling in the affairs and we need to stick to certain topics and leave others alone. And yet we find that the Bible addresses every area of life. And so to be a faithful pastor, to be a faithful minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're to preach the whole counsel of God. So that means we're going to really touch on every area of life. And here when you get to chapter 6, we know that each chapter I've got a particular uh, title for each one. And chapter 6 deals with money in service. Remember the book of 1 Timothy is dealing with the public services of the local church. If you want to know how the local churches operate, you look at the pastoral epistles, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, and then I always throw in Philemon. Most people do not, I do. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 6 we see where money is really emphasized here. And so I just want to point out some of the areas as a high point in this chapter, and then we'll go back to chapter 1 and continue with our study. Number one is people ought to be encouraged to do right in the workplace. Uh, people ought to be encouraged to do right in the workplace. I'm going to read verses uh, 1 to 5 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. It says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, the word honor means to prize them, to respect them. It says that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. That lets us know that it's important not only our behavior in church, as chapter 3 verse 15 points out, but also in every other area of life. Uh, you are a testimony wherever you go. You go to the grocery store, you're a testimony. You go out, uh, out and about in your yard, you're a testimony. You go talk to your neighbors, your testimony. You go to work, your testimony. And it says here that God in his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters. Now a master of course in our scope of belief we would see that the masters are the employers. And you ought to really respect if you work for a saved boss, you ought to prize them highly. You ought to respect them. You ought to be good to them. You should not think lightly of them, nor uh, try to take advantage of them. It says, and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them. Once again, that word despise doesn't mean to hate, as we might use the word today. It means to think or take lightly. And it says here, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Now, what Paul is telling Timothy, this young preacher, he's saying, look, you make sure and you teach this truth. You make sure that you exhort, you encourage people to be a good testimony on the job. And it says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, that's healthy words, that's words that build up. He said, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, 
Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. So just as a high point as we look at chapter six here just for a moment, we see that people ought to be encouraged to do right in the workplace. And we need to understand that the way a person works really is a reflection of the Christian life, their Christian life, as well as God himself. Because God's to make a difference in our life. And whereas back in these Bible days, it was something where a lot of them were uh, serving under compulsion. They had to work. They had to work for their boss and so on and so forth. We are free people. You don't have to work at the place you work. You say, well, yeah, I do if I want a paycheck. But if you don't like that place, you have the freedom to go work somewhere else. Whereas many in the Bible days did not have that leisure. Whoever they were serving under, they were stuck with in many cases. Many of them were slaves and so on. So they had to stay under that arrangement. And so we are told, though, that, hey, we are to honor uh, those in authority over us. A Christian employee should not take their Christian boss for granted or for an advantage. And that's important, too. I remember uh, working at the Bill Rice Ranch when I was a teenager. Of course, you know my dad worked there as a printer. And uh, I can remember that uh, our construction foreman, Harry Lippert, uh, actually uh, resigned and he, he went into doing some missionary work, going to different mission fields, and then he would do some construction work. He actually worked and helped a church there, Victory Baptist there in uh, Winnipeg years ago. And uh, I can remember that when he started out doing some of the work there in the city of Murfreesboro, and our church was a rather large church there, we ran about 1,400 there in Murfreesboro, and uh, he did a lot of work for folks in the church. And it was, he said, you know, Mike, it's like sometimes I do this work for them and then they call me brother and they say hi and they, we amen and we have a good time. He said, but a lot of them don't pay their bills. He said, I wish that they would just pay me even $10 a month. If they pay me $10 a month, if they were having a tough time, at least I'd know that they hadn't forgotten me. But it was almost like because he was a church member and they were brothers in Christ that, hey, you know, I'm a brother, you're a brother, so cut me a deal. Give me a break. And uh, it just really was a frustration. I hear businessmen at times say that they'd much rather do business with an unsaved individual than a saved individual simply because of things like that. That's a sorry testimony when we have it inside a church much less what the world may think outside the church. And so that's why I think it's interesting when you get to the book of Ephesians chapter five and six, he talks about that kind of thing. He talks about it in Colossians chapter three. He talks about it here in Timothy and he's saying, now Paul says to Timothy, you make sure and talk about this. You make sure and emphasize this because this is where the rubber meets the road. In other words, talk is cheap. And so we need to really take these things to heart. And I find it interesting that, you know, it's really important all the way through. Every word of God is important, we know. But it's interesting how a letter starts and how it ends. And here, if all the way he could end this book, he's talking about money. And so money really many times is the gauge of our spirituality. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's why I find it interesting when you get to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is preaching in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and he gets to chapter 6, and you know, you drop on down to about verse 6 and 7, and it talks about when you pray, then later on it says, and when you fast. But the first thing that he really talks about before he talks about praying and fasting, he hits the money issue. He says, when you do your alms, in other words, when you're giving, and because of that very fact, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so once you are right in the area of your heart, then you can pray right, you can fast and make a difference in your life. But here we find in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that money seems to be a real critical aspect of the believer's life, of everyone's life to be sure. 
but in the life of a believer, because naturally we're selfish. And so it really is a test to our spirituality and our Christianity and how we give. Not just money though, but also obviously in these first five verses of scripture, the way we work on the job. You may not be the most adept or skillful in your job, but you can still work hard and you can do your best and you can be a good testimony. And that's what is being emphasized in this particular portion of scripture. Then we see here that people need to keep worldly possessions in perspective. Let's look at verses six to 10 now. It says these words, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich. Now notice it doesn't say that they are rich because that's not the critical juncture. Sometimes you have those who are poorer than poor that are consumed with being rich. That will, that desire to be rich. And it says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. You have to be very, very careful when you have money as well as when you want money because you set yourself up for a lot of various temptations that say a poor man doesn't really have a throne before him because he can't do much about it. And it says here, into, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And so you have to be very, very careful. And the contentment, really, we see here from the scriptures, is critical to a happy life. I like what Webster's 1828 says about contentment. It means satisfaction of mind without disquiet. In other words, gratification. What he's actually, what the definition is actually saying here is being satisfied and being grateful with what you have. Instead of always wanting something more. If you can have more and you're not violating scripture, there's nothing wrong with that. We have some of the richest people in the world that were followers of God, Abraham, David, Solomon. I mean, Bible characters that had money. You also have the very, very poor. We find in the second Corinthians chapter eight that those people in that church gave out of their what? Deep poverty. And so it's not the uh, money that you have or the absence of the money or the much, as much money as you have we find here that we need to keep it in its proper perspective and be grateful for whatever we have, whatever God allows us to have. That's contentment. And in the course of applying biblical principles, walking with God, if God chooses to bless by giving us an abundance in a certain area, hey, we're still grateful. We're just as happy with as we were without. And that's contentment. And that's what Paul is really trying to get across to Timothy and say, hey, look, encourage the people this way because you're going to minister to a cross section of folks all along the way. You'll have those that are wealthy. You'll have those that are poor. And it's like even Jesus said, the poor you have with you always." And so we need to understand that in our economy as well as in also in the church. And so people need to keep worldly possessions in perspective and keep eternity in view. This world's goods, we've got to understand, will pass away, will it not? Just think of your vehicle. Uh, you may have bought a, view, a new vehicle uh, you know, some time ago, but hey, how about now? Uh, it's probably wearing out in some areas, uh, needs some maintenance work being done. It, it degrades. And that's the way this world's goods are. You move into a new house and after a while you're going to have dings on the wall, and things of that nature is going to have scuff marks. There's going to be issues. And so that's the way this world's goods are. They're going to pass away. But you know what? Eternity is forever. And we are in the business now of actually being able to lay up treasure in heaven. Where moth and rust does not corrupt. Where thieves do not break through nor steal. Amen? And so here we also see in verses 11 to 19 that it's not wrong to have goals. Some people say that if you just 
live a contented Christian life that somehow it takes the drive out of attaining anything in this life and uh, excelling in a particular area of life. And nothing could be further from the truth. The fact of the matter is God knows what makes us tick. And he also says that you ought to be serving uh, and actually looking at things in, in, in value as good so, uh, silver, uh, gold, silver, and precious stones in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Then you can also build out of wood, hay, and stubble as well. But he says you ought to be seeking to lay that treasure up. Uh, take your Bibles now go to verses 11 to 19. It says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. And then he goes on and says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust, in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Verse 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. He's not saying that having riches and spending the money right giving it away so on to charitable causes that that's going to earn them salvation. But it's saying, look, you are preparing for that next life. You are laying that treasure and sending it on ahead. And then you can with confidence go into eternity knowing that you will reap a reward as God has said. Take your Bibles one last time before we go to chapter 1. And go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Once again, thinking about goals, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it's a classic passage of Scripture. But we also know that the work of maturity, there are certain goals. I think parents, you know this to be true when you are rearing your children. You like to see certain things take place at certain times. You know, when children are small, you're saying, uh, how old is your child? And you want to know, okay, is it walking about the, the proper time? Uh, the first words, are they talking clearly at a certain time? Things of that nature. You're looking for those benchmarks. You're looking to see that certain goals are achieved in their life. And here we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that Paul uh, gives an illustration of, of running a race and excelling in that. Look at verse 24. He says that the first Corinthians chapter nine, he says, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. He's saying you are in a race. You and I are in a race. We're not racing against each other. According to Hebrews chapter 12, we are all running a particular race that God has for us and we ought to be what? Running to win. And he says, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. That word strive means to give oneself to, uh, to sweat if you please, to work hard at it. That striving. And it says, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertain, uh, certainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. He said, I'm not shadow boxing here. He says, but I keep under my body. He says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. I put it in its place, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So don't get into this mindset that, you know, uh, we just sort of kick back and relax as a Christian 
and whatever comes, comes, and we don't have to work at anything, we don't have to do anything, we don't have to expend any energy, nothing could be further from the truth. And if you study the life of Christ, you know that to be true, where he would rise up a great while before day, he'd work hard, he'd stay up late, and he would just give himself to the task at hand. And we Christians, we know that Jesus Christ could come at any time. And what does the Bible say? The night cometh when no man can work. And so we need to be busy about our Father's business. Amen? Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, now go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And, and uh, we're going to, uh, I don't know how far we'll get, of course, uh, with our lessons through this, but uh, we're going to go a little bit more in detail as we look at uh, the book of 1 Timothy. And uh, there's a method behind my madness to be sure in regards to this, and that is I believe that we as Christians, we need to be equipped for life at hand. And so that means that we need to study the whole counsel of God. And you know, our church, I was thinking about this just recently, we're 30, almost 35 years old. Uh, we're not baby Christians anymore. Uh, we're not just a, a young whippersnapper just getting the church started as we did in the upstairs meeting room of the Winkler Arena. Uh, we have reached a level of maturity, or should have. And so that means that we need to really give ourselves to really solidifying the doctrinal positions we have, as well as being able to pass that on to succeeding generations. But that's only going to come as we adhere to the doctrine of the Scripture, and we have these things down. And so if you look at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and Jesus Christ our Lord. As Bible believers... We must be satisfied with what I refer to as the sufficiency of Scripture. Let me say that again. As Bible believers, we must be satisfied with the sufficiency of Scripture. And let's look at some verses of Scripture in regards to that. Let's look at 2 Timothy, one book over. You know, my practice has been when I preach, and a lot of times when I preach out, I will always put my text and the verses right into my notes and I just read them. But I think when we look at a Bible study here on Wednesday night, I really want us to see this and just sink our spiritual teeth into these passages of Scripture so that you know that this is what the Bible teaches. This is what we adhere to. And so we've got to be faithful to the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's easy to start right, but it's hard to keep it going. In other words, many times you find that, if I can just use myself as an example, you know, when you're younger, uh, you have the tendency to toe the line. When you get older, you get more mellow, and you get a little bit easier in your belief system and whatnot, get a little bit more lax. And I think what Paul is trying to tell Timothy, he says, look, you've been given a doctrinal foundation. You need to make sure that you stick by the stuff until the very end. And uh, we need to do the same thing. And here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you look at verse 16, it says, all Scripture. This means that all mankind needs in regards to standing accepted and confidently before the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat is found in the Bible. It's not our connections. It's not our education. It's none of that stuff. It's this book right here. We're going to be judged according to this book right here. So we better know the book. And then instead of looking at all these other outside sources, when we have problems and issues and situations that need to be addressed in our lives, or maybe in the lives of others, including society, we find the answer is right here. And we need to be students of the Scripture. All Scripture is given, the Bible says, by what? Inspiration of God. It's been God-breathed. God gave us this book. This is not, these are not the writings of man. This is the Word of God Amen. in totality, from Genesis to Revelation. 
And there's nothing else. There's not another testament, as the Mormons would say. There's not another book you have to turn to. It's study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. John 17, 17 says, thy word is truth. And so we ought to be emphasizing in our lives the word of God. And that's why you get to books of the Bible like this that we're studying now, 1 Timothy, that talks about the local church. This gives us the instructions on how to operate the local church. And he says, it goes on, he says, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That means it gives us profit. We're helped. And so it says for doctrine, for reproof. Uh, uh, you've heard me say this a lot of times where somebody says, you know, it tells us what's right. That's doctrine, what's wrong. There it goes with the reproof. It says for correction, how to get right, and then for instruction and in righteousness, and that means how to stay right. So the Bible tells us what's right, what's wrong, how to get right, and how to stay right. And then it says this, that the man of God may be perfect. It's not talking about sinlessly perfect. We're not going to be complete that way until we're in the presence of the Lord, because then we'll see him as he is, and we'll be like him. But until then, we're going through that that progressive sanctification, that molding process, he's talking about we'll have some maturity. And that's what we want. We ought to want to be a mature Christian, not a child. As Ephesians chapter four says, it's blown about with every wind of doctrine. Boy, this guy's got a good argument, so you're swayed to that position. This person has another good argument, so you move over here to that position. You're just blown about and you go with the next craze that's on the internet. And so he says, no, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's what the Bible does for us. And so we've got to understand, even here at Pimenta Valley Baptist Church, that the scripture is sufficient. It's all we need. And that's why our Sunday school classes ought to be teaching the word of God. That's why the pulpit ought to be opening up your Bibles. It's not an entertainment center. It's not even a gospel saying. And I'm all for gospel music, love music. It prepares our hearts for the preached word. But it's the preaching of the word of God that makes the difference. It's what's profitable uh, for us. And so then if you go to Hebrews chapter four, another well-known passage of scripture, verse of scripture, it says these words in verse 12. For the word of God is quick, that means it's alive. It's the, God doesn't say that about any other book. He says it about the Bible. The word of God is quick. That means it's alive. And it says these words too. He says, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's pretty inclusive. Uh, this past week we looked at the trichotomy of man, and we saw from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, where he talks about the whole man. And it talks about the spirit, the soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, and our body. And so we see that here the Word of God actually addresses every part of man. So once again, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable. It's all we need. The Bible is sufficient. You suffer from depression, if it's not a physical thing, then you can find the answer right here. Amen? You have financial difficulty, you can find the answer right here. You have marriage trouble, you can find the answer right here. Whatever problem you have, whatever situation you encounter, you can have the answer right here. The Word of God is sufficient. And see, it's one thing to say it, but it's another thing that when those problems come our way, which in all likelihood they would, they will in some form or another, then we have to make sure that we go to the Word of God and say, okay, what does God want me to do here? And that means sometimes you're going to cut against the grain. It's not going to be the popular thing to do. And sad to say, it may not even be accepted amongst general Christianity. But when you pillow your head at night, you have to be able to say, 
God, to the best of my ability, according to your word, I'm doing what you're telling me to do. And then you let the chips fall where they may. That's, that's easy preaching. It's another thing to live it. But we need to understand that we should hold that the scriptures are sufficient. Amen? God is always careful when giving commands. If you'll look, go back to our text passage of scripture, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior. I say God is always careful when giving commands and instructions. He's very exact. You don't need to second guess what God wants. You know, if you believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, you don't need to second guess what God says about marriage. It's stated in his word. It's right there because God set it up. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, chapter 2 expands upon that. All throughout the word of God, we see where he addresses different aspects of troubled marriages and good marriages and how to have them and what to do when certain situations come up. How do you behave yourself in those situations? How do you get along one with another? It's all right there because God set it up. We also find that when it came to the ark, he gave the blueprint for the ark, did he not? He said, Noah, Genesis chapter six, I want you to take and I want the dimensions of the a boat to be this way and this way, and I want you to make it out of this material, and I want you to, I mean, he laid it all out. Very exact. He didn't say, now, no, you just sort of, here's the dimensions, you take it from there. Oh, when it came to the tabernacle, what did he do? He says, Moses, come on up here to the mount. Goes up to Mount Sinai, and he's there for 40 days, 40 nights, and what does God do? I don't know how it all transpired, but you just sort of in your mind's eye, you figure, you know, God just lays out this blueprint. He says, I've got this example. I've got this pattern that I want to show you how I want what you see here. Some people believe he actually showed him heaven and showed the tabernacle up there. And he says, I want you to take what I'm showing you here and I want you to build that down there. And he told him exactly what to do down to the rings that hold the curtains, and he had to have a certain dimension made out of certain material and so on. He was very, very exact. So you can just mark it down that when God tells us something, he knows exactly what's best, and also he's the one that lays the ground rules and actually lays out the parameters for our living, amen? And if we wanna live a life pleasing in his sight and truly find fulfillment, then we'll find out what he has to say. We'll find out what he wants to have done. How does he want us to live? And we think we're going to be in control of our own life. Uh, he can do a much better job of running our life than we can. And we find too, he told the children of Israel exactly how to leave Egypt, did he not? He said, this was what I want you to do. He laid it all out. When it came time for them to cross from the wilderness into the land of promise, he said, this is exactly how I want you to cross the Jordan. This is what needs to take place. These priests go first, carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And you know, those priests, they simply had to do what God said. It didn't make a whole lot of sense. They, I'm sure they wondered now, look, we're supposed to walk and have the soles of our sandals touch this water and then it's going to part. Wow. But that's exactly what they did. They said, well, if God said it, it's so. And so they went out and did it. <laughs> and what happened? God kept his word. But there's that faith element. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So sometimes you'll come to passages of scripture in your life, in my life. I know <laughs> what happens is you'll, you'll say, well, that's what the Bible says, but whoa, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Or I just don't see how this is going to work. Or, I don't quite understand this, but here's what he says. And what he does, he says, you just obey me. You just do what I said to do and you'll be all right. And sometimes you do what you're told to do according to the word of God. And it may not turn out the way you think that it should turn out, but let God be God. You're in his hands. 
And praise God, no man will be able to pluck you out of our Father's hands, amen? And then when you get here to 1 Timothy, cutting out a whole lot of other examples, we find that he's laid out the template for us, the pattern for us, the example for us to have a local New Testament church. That's the powerful aspect of chapter 3 and verse 15, where it says these words. It says, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You hear many Christians today and say, well, I just feel so much better at this kind of a service or that kind of a service. And, you know, I just, you know, I don't get much out of that or I don't get much out of this. I like it when they do that. Well, let me ask you a question. What are you basing that on? Sounds to me you're basing it on your feelings. But we ought to base what we do on the word of God, the sufficiency of scripture. And let's face it, in growing up, it's not always dessert time. Sometimes you have to eat your peas. Oh, you have, to, you have to eat those foods you don't like, but you know it's best for you. And praise God, you may have had some parents who said, you're not getting that dessert until you eat this, 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 and this, this. Okay, I'll just move right along with that one. But at the same time, we, we need to understand the sufficiency of Scripture and the sufficiency of Scripture even in light of the local New Testament church. Amen? And so then we see here the call to service in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. But I also want us to see, and I'm, a, I'm not going to be able to go much further than this particular point tonight, but Paul is the chosen penman for the, these books on the New Testament church. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, if you would. He's the penman. Now we know the author is God, right? And that's why a lot of times I will use penman instead of the author of the book is such and such and such and such. Now, that's just something I do. You know, like sometimes we get hung up. We'll have a, maybe a preacher come through and say, well, the author of the book is this. And what they're just simply saying is it's the penman. And sometimes we nitpick at things, especially we who are human and we speak a lot and so on. And not everything comes out the right way. Or sometimes we use words that are interchangeable and so on. But so if somebody comes through here and says the, the author of the book of 1 Timothy is, uh, is Paul, uh, don't say heresy, you know. Uh, we know that God is the author, amen. Uh, but I, that, that's why I use the word penman. Uh, God used uh, Paul to pen the words, but he gave it to him. Uh, let's look here in chapter 1, verse 12 of uh, 1 Peter. Chapter 1, I'll get there. He says, is it first? Oh, 2 Peter, I'm sorry, 2 Peter. That didn't look right. It says, wherefore, I will not be negligent. This is Peter. He says, to put you always in remembrance of these things. And that's something that we have to understand too. Sometimes if, if we get cynical or nose out of joint or we start getting a little bit critical and so on, we'll, we'll get to the point where we say, well, I've heard that before and you know, he's said that before and he's taught that before and so on. And it gets to be a little bit old hat. And if we're not careful, we, we forget our place and we forget what God's trying to do in giving us these things over and over and over again. He's trying to make a point. He's trying to help us stay on track. And you notice how many times these Bible writers said, remember, 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 remember. And so that's why they repeat themselves. And so Peter's doing the same thing, he says, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. He says, I know you know this, but I'm going to tell it again. So there's value in hearing the same thing over and over and over and over again. He says, yea, I think it meet, verse 13, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, meaning his body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. So a lot of times you'll come to church and you won't hear anything new. It won't be anything that really just rings your bell, so to speak, but you'll just be reminded, read your Bible and pray. Go tell somebody about Jesus, live right, Quit looking at that, quit dressing like that, dress like this, blah, 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 and on and on it goes, you know? And you say, what in the world? Just keep those things in remembrance. Why? Because we have the tendency to let things slip. 
And he goes on and says here in verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. Peter says, I'm, I'm going to die, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things, what? Always in remembrance. You sort of get the idea that Peter says, hey, remember these things. <laughs> he says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's making reference to the, the, uh, uh, the glorification of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. This is what gets me in talking about the sufficiency of scripture again. Peter says, look, Peter's the one that was on the mount. Remember Peter, James, and John, they went up there. They saw this take place. They saw Moses and Elijah come, carry on a conversation with the Lord Jesus. That's where Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. I mean, I think you and I would probably have the same, <laughs> you know, thing to say. Boy, it's good for me to be here. I'm glad I'm here on this mount. Why don't we build three tabernacles? You know, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. We'll just, we'll just stay here. And, it, and that's what he's saying. But now notice what he says in verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. You know, there are details from years ago. I know I was at a certain place, but I forget. I forget the fine details. And the longer removed that event is, I forget more and more about it. But that's why we have the Word of God, so we don't forget. That's the more sure word of prophecy. If we had to rely on Peter, well then if he just told us, then we would forget. Just like Peter said, I saw it. I was there, I was an eyewitness. But in the passage of time, boy, I'm sure he forgot a lot of the details. But that's why he says we have the Bible, or the more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Look at verse two, uh, chapter two, verse one. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Notice what it says here. That's why he says we have a more sure word of prophecy. That's why you and I have to be adherents to the Bible. That's why we have to learn our Bible so that when falsehood presents itself, we can say, ah, 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 that's not right. That's not right. We're not going down that road. You need to be quiet. You need to quit spreading that doctrine. You need to be qu quit talking like that. He says that, he says, because there's false prophets, but the sure word of prophecy will keep you straight. Verse two, and many, this is the danger, and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So you need to be so rock solid in the scriptures and know the scriptures so that you can refute those false teachers. Because you'll have a lot of people that will drop off by the wayside. You, you'll have a lot of people that used to sit where you sit, believe what you believe, but now are off in the heresy. They're off in the false doctrine. Why? Because they didn't adhere to the sufficiency of Scripture. Amen? And I'm sure if you've been saved for a while, you know that to be true. You can think of individuals in your own life where you say, you know, they used to believe right, but now they're whacked out. Very serious stuff. So you see here where Paul is the chosen penman for these books on the New Testament church. And I say just a few things in reference to that. This makes sense because of 
yes, the pastoral epistles, but also the other church letters that he penned. And Paul was uh, versed in both the Old and New Testament truths. He had studied the scriptures and was personally tutored by Christ. Look at Galatians chapter 1, if you would, one verse. Galatians chapter 1. You know, sometimes I wish, uh, not, not that I'm the greatest preacher in all the world, but when you get going on something, you like to just keep going and finish your thought and, and so on. And that's what is so difficult with watching a clock. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So we see here where according to Galatians and you go into chapter two and, it, and we'll look at that at another time where he actually mentions how that Jesus Christ taught him. Second Corinthians chapter 12, he was caught up to the third heaven. Saw things too wonderful for a man to see. God said, you're gonna have to seal those things. I don't want you to write about them. You know, you just, you just keep it to yourself. That's why he was given a thorn in the flesh to keep him in a humble state, dependent upon God, and uh, that way he wouldn't be lifted up with pride because of the special revelation that he was privy to. But here Paul is an apostle. And Paul, we find here, and I'll just stop with this particular point, he is really, what he's trying to do, he's trying to stabilize uh, the local New Testament churches. Remember, the, the, the uh, churches were experiencing explosive growth, especially after the uh, the, the uh, church there in Jerusalem uh, imploded and the persecution came and they went scattered everywhere preaching the gospel. Churches began to creep up all over the place. And so we see where now, because of that, Acts 15, you have a lot of the false teachers that were starting to infiltrate the churches and spread false doctrine. And so he's writing these things to stabilize. Let me show you in 2 Peter once again, if you'll go there. And, and one of the reasons why I point Peter out here is because a lot of times uh, people try to pit Peter against Paul. And they, work in con they worked in concert. One had a particular call to the Gentile people. One had a particular call to the Jewish people. And so Peter here in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, he says, Wherefore, beloved... Seeing that ye look for such things, be diligently that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So he's really saying, look, you pay attention to these general epistles, these letters that are written primarily to a Jewish audience, but also to Paul's writings that were primarily to a Gentile crowd. He said, as also in all his epistles, that's a letter, verse 16, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved. So he's not scolding them, he's, these, he's using very tender words to these believers. Seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Not lose your salvation, but also what you're losing is the stability in your Christian life, the confidence in your Christian life. They shake your confidence. And he's saying, look, I don't want that to be part of you. I want you to be rock solid. I want you to be fully persuaded. He says, fall from your own steadfast, movement, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever, amen. He's saying, keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, keep learning, keep learning, keep learning, amen. 